Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library, Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This interview today is being conducted at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio, and locally administered by Brian Powers, who happens to be our cameraman today. And today's date is the 16th of May, 2018. And today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a Korean War veteran, Donald Thomas, Thomas. Donald William Thomas. Thomas. And uh, uh, Mr. Thomas, is it all right just to call you Don? Okay, just to call you Don? You can call me anything you want to. <laughs> all right. Uh, Don, if you would tell us uh, your date of birth and where you were born. Uh, my date of birth was July the 3rd, 1933. Very historic year. Hitler came into power and prohibition ended. Uh, and I was born earlier in Kentucky. I see. And your parents' name? Uh, my father's name was William Kirby Thomas, and my mother's name was Ruth Elizabeth Setters Thomas. Setters. And uh, uh, what did your father do for a living, Don? Uh, my father had grew up on a farm, and they were very poor, and he left school at an early age, but he was uh, primarily a farmer. He did some labor work and construction. Mm -hmm. Did you have any brothers and sisters, Don? I had one brother and one sister. My brother was four years older than me, and my sister was eight years older than me. I see. Are they uh, still with us? or No, they... Uh, I lost both of them in 2010. I see. I see. What church did you all belong to? Uh, Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist. And I belong to Erlanger Baptist now. Okay. What, you say you grew up on a farm. Where was the farm at? We, we had several farms in Boone County. Uh, my father, growing up in, in uh, Southern Boone County, a Beaver Lick in that area, and we had one that was over on Route 14, close to Verona. But my dad, if somebody offered him a profit, he would sell it and go buy another one. So that's why we had several farms in Boone County. Mm -hmm. We had uh, the one, um, and I like to make a little war story too. Um, in World War I and World War II, the Germans ran out of food. So the Americans recognized that, and in addition to our other crops, they had us growing two and a half acres of tomatoes, and they had a little cannery at Walton, and and um, they had all the farmers growing tomatoes, and they take them up there and they can them for the military. And I remember being eight years old out there picking tomatoes, <laughs> and Dad had a little Molly truck, and he'd load them up, and we would hold them up to the cannery. And to feed and, the Germans. Yeah, and when the war was over, they tore down a cannery. It was just a little temporary building, and it quit growing tomatoes. Where did the name Stevens come in? Play? Where did the name Stevens come into play with your family? Uh, Stevens was our middle child. He was born in '67. Uh, oh, okay. And his middle name is Kirby. My same as my dad's. I, I name. see. Um, and what schools did you go to, Don? Uh, well, in Boone County, I went to New Haven. I went to Florence. Uh, I was living at Walton when I graduated in 51. The Korean War had just gotten in full swing a year before. And I enrolled at the University of Kentucky in ROTC, and then they had control on me. And they wanted you, if you were, could meet the physical requirements, they wanted you to stay in ROTC and get a commission. So uh, I got a commission. and active duty orders immediately. I went to Fort Benning, Georgia. I was in the infantry. And I also, I was very lucky, I was with West Point class of 55 who was taking uh, basic infantry. They were in three com in two, two different companies. And they, uh, 200 men in a company, so they rounded us off with a few of us reserve officers. So I was very fortunate. I took a real long training course, Eisenhower was president. I had very intense training, and then uh, I got orders for Korea. You graduated from, you went to the University of Kentucky in Lexington? In Lexington. And you started there in? Uh, 51. 51. 
And the high school you graduated from again? Walton. And Walton. Walton, Verona, Walton, Kentucky. Uh, and so you went, you stayed down, you stayed on campus there? Or you yeah, I lived in Lexington for the four years. And you took ROTC instruction while there and you graduated in 1955? Yes. And you had to go to on active duty right away then, didn't you? Yeah, I applied for immediate active duty and I got immediate active duty. And your first, uh, uh, your first duty station or basic training was where and what? Uh, well, they call it, we'd already had six weeks of what enlisted men have. And while we were in college between our junior and senior year, uh, this was just a basic officer's course at Fort Benning, Georgia. Fort Benning is the infantry center. If you're an infantry officer, you go there for training. I see. And how long were you there? Uh, I went on active duty, I think, at the Class started around the 1st of August, and I was there up till just before Christmas. Wow. And it was well, Eisenhower's president, and boy, he, we had detailed training. Uh, we had uh, uh, put us in foxholes and ran tanks over us. Uh, let us. We had a lot of specialized training, how to use flame floors. And uh, we were trained so that when we got to the unit, we could train, give advanced training to the enlisted men. Mm -hmm. We even let us drive a tank to familiar the, the armor units. Is that right? Yeah, they're short drive, but it was interesting. Uh-huh. So, um, from uh, Fort Benning, where'd you go? Uh, well, I had another classmate of mine who was from Detroit he graduated from Notre Dame, and he was a journalism student. I was second lieutenant too, and both of us had the same orders. And he bought a car, and we went out. We had two weeks to get to Fort Lewis, Washington. And we went out Route 66, a famous Route 66. And that was before it had any interstate roads. And then we went to Los Angeles and up the coast and we spent a couple of days and uh, and uh, uh, we want to see the Golden Gate and San Francisco, all that area, and went on up to uh, uh, Fort Lewis. And I'll isn't, never forget. Isn't, look, that, isn't that where the Fort Division is? Uh, I don't know what units they had there. Uh, the Fourth Division, you know, when I knew it was at, at uh, Fort. Uh, uh, oh, in uh, Colorado. Oh, okay. Well, uh, don't let me interrupt you anymore. Uh, okay. So you went so into We were Fort there Lewis. for a couple of days, and I got to see Mount Rainier. I'm looking at it here, and I said, no, it's up there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I had never flown in an airplane, because everybody went by rail, you know. And when I got to, uh, we we, we McCord Air Force Base there, so we went over McCord, got on a plane, flew to Hawaii. First time I'd ever been in an airplane. And uh, we got to lay in route for three days. They let you spend three days without counting toward your leading time. So I ran around over Hawaii and had a very good time, several of us. Then we got into four engine prop different plane. Went to Midway, refueled, then on into Tokyo. Spent a few days in Tokyo, then on over in Korea. So. Where did you land in Korea? Uh, we were in the Seoul airport. Okay. And it was tore up. The Capitol building was full of holes and half standing. The train station was half blown up. And we went down and got on a train. And it was looking like a train. It came out of our World War I era. They had uh, very rickety, and I'll never forget they had what's called the hot boxes, the axles on them. And they would put grease rags on there to lubricate the axles. Well, when we went north up to the 38th to Camp Hobie, where I would be, uh, we had some rock shoulders. That every time it'd slow up, we'd get off and run alongside the train because the, the Koreans would steal the grease rags out of the hot boxes to use as fuel. So that was an experience, seeing all these Korean soldiers with their clubs running on the side of the train. 
We got up, finally got up to uh, Camp Hovey, and uh, I forget the old town where it was, you know, where the train stopped. But everything had been blown up. All uh, soil looked terrible. Uh, all glass had blown out of windows. You had to, we never spent that much time, but you had to walk down the middle of the street because people would urinate out of the windows, be living in them, throwing garbage out, smell, all the other, it was right. terrible. And I remember looking at it now, and I remember I watch NHK Japanese news now, and they have a lot of scenes out of Seoul, and I see what a beautiful city, mm -hmm. <laughs> what a democracy in a few years can do. And tell us about your duties there at Camp Hovey. Well, we were short on officers. And how far from the line are you? Well, uh, we alternate half of the step on the line. We were on a DMZ. Now, they had called off the shooting, but the Chinese were across from us, and they still take pot shots at us. And um, um, we would alternate half of us be up and half of us would be up back in Camp Hovey. Uh, but we were short on officers, and I was always given two or three jobs to handle, which I didn't mind because I didn't have anything else to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't have any activities. There wasn't any television. You had two radio stations. You got a weekly newspaper. Mm. You got letters from home for your girlfriend. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, we were called out, it was in spring of 57, that the Chinese were going to be coming across in this valley. We went, we stayed there a couple of days, and they didn't show. I found out why years later that uh, when I'm going through Command General Staff College at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, that the Chinese had planned to come across. The Soviet Union told them that they were going to hit by atomic demolitions. And if they took off across, don't count on the Soviet Union helping them. At that time, I didn't know we had any atomic de demolitions. And I found out from an artillery officer who was division artillery at that time, and he was, I think, a lieutenant colonel. And I told him that I'd written myself off in the infantry, seeing me at number 10 to 1. And he said, you didn't have any, you didn't have any worries because we had one half atomic KTs on our 155 artillery. And we were going to pepper that valley if they come across. And for you and the infantry, it'd be just like shooting fish in a barrel. At that time, I understood why we stayed up on the perimeter and why the tanks were down in the valley. It took many, many years down the road before I found out about that. So they, they were going to have nuclear weapons there? Well, they didn't call it nuclear. They called it atomic. They were one-half KTs on their 155 artillery. And the Chinese didn't know this. And, and Eisenhower, see, as soon as he became president, he sent it over there. But nobody knew it. Now, our uh, regimental commander knew, but we lieutenants didn't know. It was on a need to know. And I look back and think how their thinking was, how casual it was, because here I am wiping myself off if we were outnumbered. So. And I was going to be taken prisoner. And uh, then I found out Later on, one of my old college ROTC friends had was sent to Korea, and he was at 8th Army headquarters in Seoul. And he told me, he was the one that told me to come down to a couple of hours and intercept the communications. The Russia told the Chinese, don't go, don't go, don't go, or you're going to be decimated. Wow. That's, and, and, and see, that's, that's you learn never, things over there that never get, that are classified, that never they're not even in history books. You'll never hear that, read that in a history no. book, I tell you. No. And when was this roughly? What year and month, as you recall? It was in probably around April of 57. Okay. Well, go on, if you will. Uh, okay. That's a part of history that we look forward to in these interviews. Oh, yeah. You yeah. get, uh, yeah, you. Uh, uh, find out these little things that uh, uh, 
I think that uh, uh, the other good things there, we had, I was at a meeting with Sigma Rhee, the president of South Korea, mm -hmm. uh, our president of one. I told you how they bounced us uh, lieutenants around. <laughs> Not only did I train the South Korean soldiers, they would call them rock, Republic Korean soldiers in advanced training, but they'd have these jobs they needed an officer to do, and I filled in, you know, where majors would normally do. And I went to a meeting where Sigmund Ray, where the president was once. Um, we had our uh, uh, USO entertainment at Christmas, and I got to meet Rita Marino in person. Um, Kathy Grant, who was a lady married Bing Crosby, his second wife, I met her before she had married Bing. And uh, I don't know, I, you know, I met the people I met. Um, let me back up a little bit to, I said when I went over, we stopped in Hawaii and uh, we had no civilian clothes and we had three days and I bought a Hawaiian shirt with the wooden buttons on it and ran around. 50 years later, my wife and I were in Hawaii. She'd never been to Hawaii. And I got out my old Hawaiian shirt. And I'm over there at a luau, and a lady comes up to me, and she's looking at my shirt, and she says, that's a collector's shirt. She says, uh, uh, they don't make that shirt anymore. It had wooden buttons, they had something else, some material. She says, that's very valuable. And I said, how valuable? And she says, would you take up $100 for it? Two hundred dollars? I said no. Uh, my daughter had used it when she went to UK when they had some uh, luau parties or luau. She had worn a couple times, but anyway, I brought it home. My older daughter, I said that's yours. <laughs> it's a collector's shirt. <laughs> but but just you know the things that you do, like buying this shirt when I'm there, and how it turns out to be a collector's shirt. Yeah. And uh, at the time, I hated it. It was the worst thing that happened to you get Korean Or As I look back now, and the experience I got and the working with people, it was a blessing in disguise to get that Korean trip. Did you get into town there so much? Did you get what? Did you get into the town or village as much in, while you were in Korea? Uh, no, I never got in. The towns have been destroyed. And we couldn't eat the food, We, we you know, and the first thing... Why uh, couldn't you eat the food? What's that? Why couldn't you eat the food? Well, uh, there was growing rice paddies with human waste, and even the carrots they pulled out are horaceous. Right. Uh, we weren't allowed to eat. And we were on what's called B rations. We had everything in the mess hall except fresh things. You didn't have any fresh milk or lettuce or... Uh, when I would go in R&R in &R Japan, I'd go in and eat lettuce and hamburgers. I saw when I'd give a day's pay for a hamburger, I just, yeah. <laughs> you know, fresh bun. And, yeah. But uh, I got traveled quite a bit in Japan too, which I literally loved at that time. You could go on the, the Ginza and for $2, the exchange rate was three twenty. dollars uh, uh, 320 for a dollar, but for two dollars you get the finest meal on the Ginza. Mm -hmm. Now it would cost you 50, yeah, at least 50. Yeah. So you, I was there in the glory days when I was in Japan. Um, did you make it friends with any of the Koreans that, that you stayed in contact with or anything? Oh, like yeah, that? we had we had one uh, young Korean who, um, well, another officer and I, one officer, shared a insulate tent together. And he cleaned our tent, made our bed, and we paid him seven and a half dollars a month, which was big money over there for them, because right. he'd worked for several. On on Kyung Chung. Uh, and Ayn was about 17, a real nice young Korean. Uh, I'll tell another little story too. We were allowed to have one dog. Well we we had uh, this dog that was stolen by one of the men in the company, he had been transferred to us. He was been court-martialed and hacked down to a private. And uh, he stole a dog and sneaked out this village to trade it to one of the prostitutes. Well, the war officer that shared to me, he was, he was an old man, he was 37. I was 22. 
but uh, he had been captured in World War II, fought in North Africa, really a tremendously intelligent person experience. So uh, he was the armored man, take care of the tanks and uh, tank maintenance. And uh, anyway, we found out I stole the dog. As An Pyong Chung come in and says, your dog was stolen. He told the house it was in, the little shack, and the prostitute. And I remember Chief Warren Officer Lott took a tank out there and turned a tube right into the house, <laughs> scared the devil out of the people. <laughs> and they hopped out, went down, got the dog. He was tied in the back of the house, put him in the tank and put him back home. <laughs> but those were one of the funny little stories that, you know. I forgot in our interview here, though, that you were assigned to the 32nd Infantry Regiment to the 7th Division. Yeah. Yeah. And you had two other regiments, the 31st and the 17th. The 17th, yeah. Um, that's a famous outfit, that's why we're familiar with it. But uh, you got assigned to the 7th Division as soon as you got there? Yeah. Uh huh. And how long did you stay with the 7th Division there? Oh, gosh. I left. Well, let me tell you another story. <laughs> um, if you went by surface, by ship, you could leave two, East two weeks early. If you flew, you had to stay an extra week. So I elected to fly back, and uh, I left, it was probably, uh, probably the early part of July of 57. I got to Japan, and the day of the old piston-driven planes, they had a whole bunch of uh, dependents and these screaming kids I was there for 11 days waiting to get on a plane. And they, they had USO groups there. And they had uh, brought in a USO group they called Kids from Home. And they were a bunch of some of the Eastern University entertainers. And they had uh, all the nephew of uh, Willie and Joe. Uh, Bill Mullen. Bill Mullen, his yeah. nephew, was in charge of this group. Mm -hmm. So we were staying in the same hotel, and we were free. They'd say, well, you're free to run around until the next day at a certain date. He was fixing me up with a date with some of these good-looking women, and I'd go out with them, and I was having a ball going out there and every night with them. And finally, they got around that they still had a big backlog of people. They put 20 of us, all of us were first lieutenants, coming back to get off active duty on an aircraft carrier. And I spent two weeks on the USS Cape Esperance coming across the Pacific. Here I am an infantry officer, coming out of the Golden Gate to California. Then flew from there to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, to be released from active duty, then on a home. But I tell a lot of these Navy people, that I've been on Midway and I spent two weeks on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm telling them a tale. But I'll tell you what, when we come out of that Golden Gate, that was a beautiful sight. And you're still a first lieutenant at that point? Uh, first lieutenant, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I was, went on a second lieutenant, mate first right. while I was here. And uh, so they take you to Fort Chaffee? Yeah. And what state's that again? Uh, Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. That's where we got our release from active duty. Are oh, you discharged there from active duty? Yeah. Now, uh, I, I was re released as reserve status. I had a six-year obligation, you know, with the reserve. So I was very fortunate. I came back and they started a special forces unit. I told him that we were trained to go into southern Poland. And I lucked out on that, but I had to go back through jump school because I wasn't everyone qualified. And I went back through jump school and I spent. Uh, Where'd you go to jump school? At Fort Benning. Okay. Yeah, that's where Fort Benning has yeah. it. And how long was that? Uh, that was four weeks. Now, they have briefer courses, but we had very intense, all kinds of training, you know, simulated malfunctions. And we jumped out of 34 foot towers and Fort Benning's got these 250 foot towers. They pulled us up. I come off one of those. I can show you which one I came off of. And that's been 60 years ago, <laughs> over 60. Uh, but uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, I really enjoyed. I got a lot of good training on military. I really did. I got 
special forces. Uh, I was, we were trained if we went to Poland on all the major weapons, uh, World War II German weapons. And, uh, Why were you gonna go and be dropped into Poland? To train and organize guerrilla warfare. Against the uh, Russians? Uh, no, uh, well, the Soviet Union occupied it. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the uh, Hungarian uprising? It had happened just a short time before. And what was sad was they had uprising in the city, but the Soviets come in and crushed it. But they had stuff like uh, rockets and everything, they didn't know how to use them. And uh, we were trained how to use rocket launchers. Uh, we could ignite them electronically by a wool sweater, hold one wire and take the other wire and rub the stack electricity and fire rockets. We didn't need a rocket launcher. <laughs> we just put a V-board in them in and hook your combo wire. You can always get communication wire. And from the static electricity, you could set them up? We could set it. If you couldn't find a radio battery, you could always find radio batteries, but if you couldn't wind, you could set them off by static electricity. So you had uh, jump training for four weeks. Uh -huh. What other training did you have in Special Forces before they would think to send you? Well, we anyway. went to Fort Drum, New York for cold weather training. And, and the last week of January and first week of February. And we went out, uh, <laughs> if you ever saw the pine trees up there, the wind comes from the west and blows all the limbs around. <laughs> but anyway, you could go up to these trees and on the side away from the wind was usually a hole and it had, it would snow and then it would melt for a little bit and make a nice layer. You go down there and tunnel out of there and get a place out of there where you could sleep and all that snow. After I took all the train, <laughs> I said, I found out, I said, Thomas, you know, you were considered cold weather qualified by spending a winter in Korea because I remember crawling out of a sleeping bag when it was 13 below zero one time. But the air come down the Gobi Desert and it's dry, it doesn't have any moisture and it doesn't take the heat away from you like it does around here. I see. In spite of the fact, you know, the numbers are there. Uh, I, I was never really that uh, uncomfortable. That cold. But you're young and you know, you're, we had good equipment and uh, oh, you kill me now. <laughs> yeah. So, any other special training uh, now that you're in special forces in Fort Bragg, I mean, Fort Benning, and then cold weather training in New York? Uh, I got to tell you a Chattahoochee River story. The Chattahoochee River between Alabama and Georgia. On December the 15th, we had to make a river crossing. So we got our poncho out and we put brush on it and made a poncho, uh, made a raft. We took off our clothes and our weapons, and we swam that river. Now the water had come down out of the mountains of north. I got across that river. It's not a real wide river, but I was so cold, I chattered, I shook for two hours. After my clothes were dry, you know, up on the, and I never once was as miserable in Korea as I was ch crossing that Chattahoochee mm -hmm. River on December the 15th, 1955. Mm. So yeah. when they make the train worse than the actual thing. <laughs> 1957. <laughs> well, uh, 57 is when I came back. This was before I went to Korea. Oh, before you, oh, it was. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, our, our, our um, train wound up at just before Christmas. Everybody oh. went home for Christmas. And... Okay. All right, so um, Tell us why you were being, what you were being trained for again in special forces about this Polish. Um, it was uh, the the Soviets had occupied all those countries after World War II, right? And um, uh, uh, Yugoslavia, Tito was one of the few that didn't let the Soviets, you know, in. He kicked her butt out. But they were occupied Poland, and uh, in the event, you know, they had an uprising against the Soviet Union, 
we were to train and organize guerrilla warfare in Crack Island, Southern Poland, in the city. And we were in like 10 men teams. And we wouldn't went around 10 together. We were just in civilian clothes. We would have been persecuted if you're in civilian clothes. Right. But we were trained on every possible weapon that they'd had, like the World War II. Uh, German weapons were still prevalent in the Russian weapons. And we were also, they had a lot of German, uh, Russian tanks, T-54 and T-55. My God, Stalin made them all so many of those. And we knew all the weak points. They're not a good tank, but mm -hmm. how to knock those out easily. And we were trained like on a track, it's like a dead track. They had pivot points, they're like a big nail through there. You'd go up in front of them and pull one of those out by hand and you'd knock the track off. Where the U.S. had what's called live tracks, so all the flexing's done in a rubber, and you can't do that on a U.S. tank. But there, if they ran around the desert, the sand would eat those up, and they were not a good tank. Mm. And we knew where the fuel tanks were and how to knock them out. And another thing, another weakness they had, they were, the Soviet unions have a lot of cold weather, so they ran the exhaust system down through the tank to heat it. Well, if you use them in the desert, people got so hot they had to open the hatch, and when they opened the hatch, they were vulnerable, you know, to the infantry. But we were, we were just taught how to knock out tanks to, you know, the underground there. Mm -hmm. We were trainers for the uh, police people. What about your language skills? What about? Uh, language skills. Uh, we were taught certain phrases. We had one uh, Polish sergeant, and he taught us a lot of just phrases. But the thing of it is, if you were caught by the Soviets, you were taught just to act stupid. And, you know, and they didn't know the Polish, and they didn't know, <laughs> you didn't know Russian. So, uh, they, in other words, you played dumb to get them just to, hey, oh, he's a dummy, leave him alone. How were they planning on getting you into Poland? Uh, well, on the Special Forces patch, they have three, like lightning stripes, and that's infiltration by air, land, and sea and we would have jumped in. Mm -hmm. Now, did you men have to go into Poland? No, uh, you know, it never happened. The Soviet Union, well, I, I got out of Special Forces when I had to go through Command General Staff. I had uh, eight and a half, uh, nine and a half years in, and um, uh, I had a business to run, and I just didn't have that time, you know, to put in. And, uh, but when the Soviet Union broke up in 89, you know, the Berlin Wall come down, then they pulled out of those countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the time of, about when you were training? When did, when did they decide to send you to uh, the command general staff school? You no, know, I, I had to volunteer for it to get promoted to make lieutenant colonel. Okay, when did you uh, get promoted to captain? We forgot that. Uh, I got commoted to captain. Um, I think it was about 1960 or 61 along there. Okay. And then I had to uh, go through command general staff and made, I made major in toward the end of the 60s. And I got delayed there for a while. Uh, so I could stay in a unit, yeah, I stayed in a captain's lot. And uh, then I made lieutenant colonel in 75. Uh, what is this uh, command staff school you're talking about? Um, it is, a, you get a master's degree in military science. Uh, everybody thinks it's learn to pull a trigger on a gun, but it's not. Uh, I, I told you that uh, Princeton, some of their professors, they had a contract with them to teach us management courses. And we had a whole bunch of management courses. And then we had, uh, like military history, uh, the effects that their political thinking had, 
like the English, where they had a caste system. Their privates were, you know, the lower caste. And um, they more or less considered them expendable. And, and World War I was really broke down the caste system in England. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you've ever been over in Assam, the Brits believed in burying them where they fell. And if you go over in Assam, you can see a British cemetery, World War I, and look at a distance and see another one. It's very interesting travel from a historic point of view. Mm -hmm. But uh, Blackjack Pershing, when we are in World War I, uh, you're not going to have our privates. We're going to have our privates. And he was foremost in his thinking of hitting the enemy, but not going out there using privates to be expendable, just keep throwing privates in. And um, MacArthur was great in the Pacific. He would hit an island if he got resistance, he'd pull back and hit him on another side. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. was thinking, and that's really saved a lot of our men for the wars we've been in. Uh, probably Vietnam was a bad one, but uh, you know, our number of fatalities was far less than some of our uh, other... Uh, how, how long a course was that? Command General Staff? Well, I went, they had a USAR school in Cincinnati. I went from September to May for one night a week for four years. And then I went on active duty for five years of two weeks active duty. And I went up for three, three two-week periods up east. And then um, I went to Fort El Paso, Texas for the air defense uh, for their training. And when the heck did I go? Uh, oh, on my last time I went to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas to finish. Mm -hmm. But I had some good training. I, I'll never, I don't regret it. it I think uh, you, didn't you mention something, uh, training out in Colorado? Yeah, a mountain training. And that, was that for the 11 Special Forces? Yeah. Or? They took us on the North Cheyenne Canyon. We were repelling off those cliffs. And we had scree slopes. The scree is where the rock breaks up in small mounts in those valleys. And they're training you on scree slopes. If you want to send a mountain, you get no screed of slopes and you can dig your heels in and you can slide with it, but you can fly down them and still, you know, stay up intact. And uh, uh, also we were up in, high up in the mountains. I'll never forget when a storm came in and we could look over one valley and we were above the clouds and see the lightning and carrying on and the other one was dry. We were up that high. And you were repelling down uh, these mountains, and what were some of the heights of the mountains you were repelling? Uh, some of them are uh, 600, where well, your climbing ropes go six, 120 feet, and then you have to go down driving the pitons, you don't go down another. Um, we had on some, they're six, 700 feet. They were in the North Cheyenne Canyon, there at Colorado Springs. When you go from Colorado Springs, go west, you go into North Cheyenne Canyon. And that's where the training on the hunt repelling was done. Mm. But it was very interesting. And it had to be cold too. Well, uh, let me tell you another story. When I go out to Fort Carson, I had a Volkswagen bus and I would uh, take the Volkswagen bus out. And my wife, we had a little icebox in it and the kids stuff. And they would fly out the second week and they would run around in the mountains in Colorado in that Volkswagen bus on a vacation. So I had my second week while I was in training and they were taking a vacation because I had a business that it was hard to get away on a vacation and spend you know the time with the military. But they went out and I had climbing ropes and everything and they took up, they learned repelling and all the real high cliffs. But my kids, and my wife she did repelling off of the same place where I took my training. Is that right? Mm. Oh yeah, the kids love my military, the things they got to do. You, you keep talking about your private business. What business did you have, Don? Um, 
well, I started out in accounting, and I did the um, accounting work for an automobile salvage deal where he bought wrecks and tore them up. Well, I started a little business there in Ellesmere. I had a British car, just on foreign cars, mostly British cars and Volkswagens, and I call it Alpine Imports. And I ran that for about 17 years when I sold it. But, Were you uh, selling automobiles? Yeah, I was selling automobiles, but I handled strictly foreign. I didn't handle anything American. Where was Alpine Motors located? Uh, in Ellesmere. Did it, you know Ralph Crawford? Al who? Ralph Crawford. Oh, yeah. Ralph is a good friend of mine. Renz Valley Motors. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine, too. Oh, he is? Yes. Oh, we've been we've been friends for 40 years, uh, over 40 years. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you more about that, nothing about me, and this is your interview, but uh, I, so how long did you have Alpine Motors? I was there in... Um, From what year to what year, roughly? Um, 70 to 87. 1970 to 1987, okay. And I had the land, I sold the land. And where was it located at again? Um, if you go... On Dixie Highway? From Dixie Highway, if you go due east, it was about two miles. Mm -hmm. You cross the railroad tracks and uh, uh, the front of it really faced the railroad tracks. And there was a trailer park next to me, a mobile home park next to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And why did you give that up? Uh, well, uh, everybody was getting into the foreign car business, and I, it was taking so much of my time, you know, seven days a week or six days a week, and uh, uh, I, I just had a chance the fellow wanted to buy it, and I sold it to him. Who bought that? Uh, he turned out to be a loser. He wanted to go back in the autom in the to American cars and. Um, well, it's it's not important. If you can't think of it, don't worry about it. Yeah. What'd you do with your life after you sold the place? My what? What'd you do then after you sold that place? Uh, I went back and did some accounting work. And then uh, I went uh, during the tax season. I worked down for IRS seasonally doing review, tax review. And I really liked it. I worked all during the bad weather. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I had some, uh, uh, oh, I, I started getting real estate and I had some rental property, taking care of the rental property, doing the maintenance work on it. Mm -hmm. I still have a few pieces of rental property now. How did you end up working out of the uh, Union Central building we talked about? Um, well, that was when I was in county, when I came back to Korea. Um, I uh, got a job with Boyd Roebuck and Company, and um, they were part of the uh, Parker and Gamble family. And uh, Boyd Roebuck was a very, very impersonal. He was an attorney and accountant, but you only practice with one in Ohio. And he was one of the reasons why I got out of accounting. I started getting a little bit of high blood pressure. I was taking people's problems home with me, which I learned not to do that anymore. But he had a heart attack in 1967 and died, and I decided to get out of accounting, and that's when I went into the automobile, uh, you know, into the salvage business. Mm -hmm. But um, I always kept accounting close at hand. I, I've done taxes now for AARP for about 16 years, and I try to keep up with taxes. We haven't talked about your romance in your life. Um, my romance in my life? Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> I had, uh, when I was in Lexington, I dated a girl. And while I was in Korea, I got a couple hours a week. And it was very strong. And no more when I got back, I get a Dear John. 
You got a deer, John? Yeah. And I wasn't to blame. It was a very complex cause. I did not see her for 21 years, and I'm down in um, Lexington at a band meet. My older daughter was in it. And here I ran to her in the stands. And she had a daughter that was at the same meet. So she called me up, told me what a mistake it had been. She had been married five years and had three kids and the fellow broke her arm, beat her. But what had happened, her mother liked me and she and her mother had these intense disagreements. And I think she went off and married this fellow on a spare of a moment. Now, you want to hear something else? Yeah. About two months ago, I was down like and had lunch with her. <laughs> I've been a widower for six years now, <laughs> but having lunch with an old girlfriend you got a dear John from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was 84 and she was four years younger than me and she was 80. <laughs> now, is it going any further than that? No. <laughs> yeah. That's history. Yeah. We're friends and. No, well, that's good. That what is, that's sort of a paradoxical story there, you know. But uh, tell us about your the real love of your life, your wife. Oh, my wife was. Uh, and how you met her and her name. And what... I met her at a dance. She was she she had gone to Newport and graduated from Newport School, uh, public school, Newport High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, and her name Lorraine Rush. R U S H. Yeah, L L Lorraine Ernestine Rush. Because mm -hmm. a lot of her friends called her Ernie as a nickname. Uh, she had a very high IQ. She, her father had some drinking problems, so she never had the money to go to college. But nor, but University of Kentucky had an extension school up here. She had taken some courses, and she worked for Procter and Gamble when we got married. Well, after we were married, uh, well, she, how'd you meet her? I met her at a, at a dance. I went with some friends over at a dance, I don't know, someplace, and mm -hmm. I met her at a dance. Okay, and, and about the, what year is this that you met her? Um, it was either 59 or 60, okay. early 60, because we got married in November of 60. Was the uh, dance here in Kentucky or Ohio? It was in Ohio. Uh -huh. Tony but, Allen, maybe? Pardon me? What do you think the dance was? Coney Allen? No, it was up on a hill there. There was some... Uh, Alt um, Park? Well, anyway. I don't remember it, but anyway. Anyhow. Who introduced you to your... Um, I went with some friends who were in a reserve. I was in a reserve. I was in a reserve unit. Uh, what happened, as soon as I got back, Kentucky had the 100th Division Reserve. And I was in it, and they reorganized all these divisions, and they moved all of them downstate, uh, what was left of the 100th. So I went with the 83rd Division, which was Ohio uh, Reserve. But I was just with them a short time. But some of the lieutenants in there were uh, uh, single. And uh, uh, I went with one of those out there where at the dance. I met Lorraine there. Mm -hmm. But Lorraine had, was a very intelligent, and um, she went through college while our kids were growing up at NKU and graduated cum laude, and she had a very high IQ, and she was an art major, and she taught art for 25 years. And, Where did um, she teach art at? At Ackerman Elementary in Boone County at Florence. Sure. Yeah. She taught from 1980, I think, till 2005. But she had IQ was out in space. Our kids, uh, Renee, when she started UK, didn't have to take freshman English. She passed the English test and got credit for it. And she had our kids off to a good start, all three of them. All three of them. Who are the other two children besides uh, Renee? That was Stephen. He was in the middle. And then Shelley, who works down at uh, Disney World. Uh, Shelly is Denise Michelle. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you got married in uh, November of 1960. Then, November right? the 26, 1960. Yeah. 
And then Lorraine, we were married 51 years in 2011. She went down with Renee to Disney World. They went on a cruise with Shelley. I picked them up at the airport on the 18th. And what was really sad, one of her classmates, high school classmates had been ill and she was expected to lose her any time. And she said, Lorraine was dragging in, she was sick. She said, had her friend passed away? And I said, no, not yet. She was went to the hospital on the 20th of December. She was diagnosed as leukemia and said she'd have three and a half months to live. She lasted three and a half weeks. And on January the 14th, 2012, she passed away. I see. But she did a good job on our kids. I mean, she, uh, I joke about Shelly, my youngest, going to school center through four years of college and she works at Disney World. She worked with a mouse and a duck. <laughs> but she, I got to tell you another story on selling. I, have, I was in a British car business. Uh, that's what a uh, big business when MGs and all those triumphs were popular and Volkswagen Beetles. Uh, but I taught my kids to drive sticks. Shelly is managing a hotel. She got a in food and hotel management. And she teaches marketing and um, troubleshoots the hotel center. When one of them's having a problem, she goes in and takes over and gets it going. One of the valet parkers come up and says, Shelly, there's a fellow with a 911 Porsche and stick and none of us can drive a stick. There she is, a manager down parking the, <laughs> the Porsche. <laughs> By the way, I have a 12 year old granddaughter and I've already told her she's going to learn how to drive a stick. I belong to the British Car Club and I have a 52 MG. Yeah. Um, Brian, uh, do you have any questions you'd like to ask Don? Yeah. Well, you, you were an ROTC, right? Yeah. When did you, were you a freshman when you joined? Yeah, you had four years of ROTC. In fact, in the colleges then, uh, the state colleges, they wanted you to go in ROTC. Uh, this was Blackjack Person, you know, he started that after World War I. I. Give him credit for pushing ROTC because it was a blessing. When I was, uh, I told you in Korea, when the new regimental commander and he congratulated me, I'm a UK graduate too. He had a reserve commission. And when World War II come along, he was, uh, had worked his way up and he was with the 35th division in Italy. And he was a battalion commander then. And he had come up through ROTC, but he stayed on to get in 20 years since, you know, he had uh, had all those years in World War II. But uh, they encouraged you to take it, you had to take two years. And then uh, if you passed a physical, you could go into advanced ROTC. And I had good friends, all those have knee problems or leg problems. I had a cousin, same age as me, who grew up in Petersburg. And um, he was, uh, they called it Cal College and College of Agriculture. I was in a commerce college. And um, I, I had a cousin who broke his arm as a kid and it had not got set quite right. And he could not make advanced ROTC. But if he had two years, if he went as a list of man, you got like an E3 or an E4, you got some promotion, you know, on up the line. Uh, but in advanced ROTC, they cut out a lot of them. They couldn't make it physically. And the infantry was pretty strong. Um, you could go into other branches. Um, like, I, like I had a friend that had gone to Xavier who had eye problems, and he went into the Medical Service Corps. Now, they'd take him, but they wouldn't let him go into a combat because, you know, his eyes, he had to wear glasses all the time. Well, I was curious how you, why you decided to go to ROTC. Did you have anybody in your family that had any kind of military background or anything? No, but the Korean War was going on. You had your choice of going to ROTC or you're going in as a listed man and going to as a private. <laughs> so, so you had, ROTC had control on you. So uh, if, 
if they didn't have control, they were reverted back to the draft board, and you'd been drafted immediately. I got my draft board. I had to, you know, go down and register as soon as I was 18. And I lived in Boone County, and I, I got it from Moore Burlington then. Uh, what were you studying in, in college? Uh, I was an accounting major. Uh, it was called the College of Commerce. It's now the College of Business and Economics. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I, I enjoyed it. it uh, uh, I, I really had some good training. We had a couple hours, uh, a few hours taught by the Law College of Business Law. And uh, they said, we're not going to make you an attorney, but we're going to teach you when to get one. And it helped me in business because I learned <laughs> to avoid the dangers. And I was in business all those years, and I never once had to hire an attorney. But when I saw trouble, I stayed away from them. And I, I'd have people call me or threaten me, and I'd say, look, you can, you can threaten all you want, but we've never had a contract. You've got to have a meeting of the minds. Meeting of the minds is a legal term. And when they hear that, if they say, they'd back off. <laughs> what was your basic training experience like? Did you do basic training? Uh, at Fort Benning? Uh, what was yours? Oh, we had very intense. Of course, all of us were in good shape. And you know, like being with a West Point class, all those fellows in top physical condition, swimmers. Oh, uh, one of the things they gave a swimming test. They had a swimming pool. Uh, it was really mostly for the enlisted men. Real long, it was in this little valley. You had to go down and take off your boots and take everything out of your pocket. But with your clothes on, swim from one length down to the other end. And if you didn't make it all the way down, you had to go train in the evening after hours and go down and, and uh, do the swimming. But I could swim. Uh, you know, I wasn't a fast swimmer, but if I got tired, I could always roll over and the jellyfish float. I can do the jellyfish float, uh, but I didn't have any trouble making it. But the clothes on, you're a little more awkward. Sure. And then the test was on December the 15th, crossing the Chattahoochee River. I will never forget that. That was the most miserable day I ever spent my life. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I say <laughs> Fort Benning <laughs> the night there was worse than what I ever did in Korea. <laughs> but the, the training I had experience is just unbelievable. And uh, uh, meeting the South Koreans, training South Korean soldiers, getting to know the Orientals. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Orientals. You don't find a lazy one. And, what, were you, what weapons were you trained? And was that who you were training the Koreans with? Was it the same kind of weapon? Uh, well, you were training everything in the infantry. You had to learn every infantry weapon to be able to teach it. And in fact, I, we had a 3.5 rocket sand and I tank rocket the bazooka. <laughs> I went out one time and uh, the regiment would turn you loose, even the second lieutenant. They'd say, Where do you want to go? You go out and do what you want to. And I went on the mountains and I threw some Alabama tanks on some of these rocks. <laughs> and I had, I think, a couple of rounds of ammo they brought out and dropped off for me from the ammo dump. So I go out and, first of all, they cut my class. They took, only had about half of them. We had all these ammo to fly. To add to it, it snowed that night, and the snow had covered up all these joints and <laughs> made on the mountains. So we're out there knocking the snow off and firing a heck out of rockets just to get rid They didn't want any turned in stuff to get rid of them. Well, the Koreans, those rockets had little brass pieces on them. Well, the Korean civilians would go out and they wanted this brass, and we would fire around the rockets, and we had to watch because the Koreans would be running there trying to get to the rockets. <laughs> So here I am. Now we had Katusas, Korean Army trainee, and they didn't come out of Geneva. Well, I have to send them out to a club to beat these people off. <laughs> you know, or you can't go out and beat people with a club. But that's why I say you had experience you never had any training for. It. You just had to have judgment calls. But uh, uh, I trained these fellows on 
you know, the anti-tank weapons. And, and we're trained. Let me tell you one other thing, too. Uh, out in this, you had these valleys, and you had a no man's land. It was just rough mountains, and maybe over there about three or four miles, there'd be another valley, and it'd be another regiment, like 17th was on our left, or 31st, I don't remember which one. Uh, but in the no man's land, you didn't have any troops up there because you couldn't resupply them. You know, if they come through those mountains, they would be spotted. And, um, but anyway, we have these rock soldiers. They would go out and they would catch uh, a Chinese or a Kenshiam, you know, come over on a patrol. And uh, we would get them away from them before they killed them. And I didn't get directly tied up this too much, but the Chinese soldier was given a stuffed bag of food about that long, and he lived on it for three days. It was doped up. It was terrible. We would get them and take them down to the mess hall. And a lot of times if a mess was set up out in the field, he would throw all his leftovers and have a pot of soup because you had men coming out of those mountains all hours of the day and night and a good hot bowl of soup. I love a hot soup to this day from climbing over those mountains. But anyway, they get these prisoners, these captured Chinese, and their stomach was shrunk, they couldn't eat much, but they gave them a little bowl of hot soup. And they had never had hot soup. They had never had hot chocolate. And they thought it was poison. So to get it, the mess sergeant would put out, if there were three of them, put out four cups and pour a little bit in each cup, and he'd pick one up and drink it. Well, then they would pick up one and drink it. And they would lick it. And, and um, then they would wait about four or five hours and give them another bowl of soup. And, you know, they couldn't eat much at the time. And by that time, they were drinking a cup of hot chocolate. And uh, they weren't beaten. Uh, they were, it was cold. They were given a sleeping bag or someplace where it was warm. But, and they would be interrogated. Uh, they got out of our hands at that point. But the point being is love your enemy. When they were sent back, they had been told they had been beaten and they were so used to eating hot food they'd never had before, and drinking hot chocolate they'd never had before. And they were just, we spoiled them. They would, the Chinese would never put them on the line again. How would you find those Chinese? Were you just people would be on patrol and they were in the mountains? And they were yeah, well, we, uh, well, we did, the, we let the rock soldiers capture most of them. And they could be pretty brutal, you know, if, uh, what they do, they'd usually catch them sleeping or something like that. And uh, they'd bring them into us. And we were told them not to harm them. Uh, but they used to joke about the, the rocks when they wanted to get information out of anybody. They would march them along a cliff and then they'd kick them over and go down and pick up the pieces. <laughs> that was a joke. I never saw it happen. But <laughs> I've heard that expression. You call them a rock or rock soldier? ROK. That's a, uh, the, the South Korean or Republic of Korea. They call them ROK. But a lot of our enlisted men were South Korean, the privates. We just had a few, uh, you know, regular GIs. And another thing they would do is they had what was called a Katusa pack. They were, we would get paid, but they would get a pack each month with raiders in them and some chewing gum and and uh, just never got maybe two or three dollars in money. Well, toward the end of the month, they'd run out of money. Well, I'd go down in the days of nickel candy bars, I'd buy a box of Hershey bars or something toward the end of the month and go up and I'd give them out to them. And they would eat half and keep half to take out to the village to some of their family members or friends and give them. And that, that's something that uh, uh, I have a lot of respect the, the South Koreans, they were. And, and where did those troops, the rock troops, where did they sleep at? Where were, where were they? They, yeah. they, slept in our, they slept in a regular barracks with the GIs when we were in our you know, area, they had these little narrow beds. And they, they had built some quonsets. That was another interesting thing. They built some quonsets. Now, the officers, we had these insulated tents. We were up a little bit on the side of the mountain, but they had these barracks. And um, what happened, the engineers, before the monsoon season hit, would dig out this creek or this small river we were around, 
Well, they had one quince that they had built, and it was down a little bit lower than the others, and they were afraid that water would get in it. And they went through and they took up the floor, and uh, the floor and four by eight sheets of plywood and braces, <laughs> and they got 200 men in a company. They got enough men to, to get inside and on the outside and lift and carry this up on the side of the mountain. I'll never forget that. <laughs> when the monsoon season's over, they took it back, back down, but in place. But I'll tell you what, when you have uh, all these men, uh, it's amazing the things you can do if you have to. Is that Camp Hobie you're talking about? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, how, how, I mean, you must have picked up some Korean, I guess, to. Oh, oh I, I learned a lot of Korean, a lot of Japanese, but I don't remember one from the other now. In the same way, I took French when I was in college, and I got where I could, you know, do a fair amount of French. I, I never could pronounce it. I never could get out of my eyes and all that, but I could read it. And now I've lost that on it. I've got, I know some. I travel in France, and I can usually read, you know, but... Uh, so you were... You were at the DMZ. You, you were, yeah. Where you? Uh, they called it the 38th parallel. Right. Uh, okay, it ran around, and it rode up over a mountain and down. And um, we, uh, uh, what it is, is they have a fence, and they had like 100 yards south. You cannot occupy it. You can send patrols on it, but you cannot occupy it. And then the same distance on the other side. Well, that would put them at a distance. They would wait about dark, and they used to throw around at you, I think, to get you excited. I heard one go over my head, and I said my chin made a 100-yard dash in a record time to the ground. Uh, and I had a carbine. Carbine's not very, you know, you can't get much distance. And I looked in the bush and threw around back. It was like, you know, I acknowledging you around. Now, my regular weapon, uh, I was a lieutenant, he carried a carbine. Well, in combat, they were taught priority of fire if you see somebody with a fire carbine shooting. Uh, I had me an M1 that I was going to take if things broke out. I, I had my M1. Because over there you had, if you're up on mountains, sometimes you had some great distances. Well, we, you know, carbine a couple of, oh, a couple of hundred yards and that's it. And M1, at 500 yards, you can make somebody jump. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any top brass visit in the area? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see, I was trying to think of, we had one, one general, well, we had Sigmund Rhee, the president of South Korea, uh, came up. Uh, I, I'll tell you what, it was strange was there weren't any women there, and they had some special service women come in, and here, they're getting off a bus. There were no buses, everybody went, you moved in a Jeep or a two and a half ton. And the roads were bad, and the, the speed limit was very limited, like 25 or 30 miles an hour. But they had a special service group up with some girls in it. And I remember getting off a bus, and I'm sitting there gawking at them. I hadn't seen a round eye in so long. They were slant eye round eye, you know. <laughs> I hadn't seen a round eye so long. <laughs> were they there to entertain? Oh, yeah. We had some very good entertainment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and another story that at Fort Benny, I mentioned this fellow, Tom Quinn, who was going to Notre Dame, and Tom was a journalism major. When he got over there, they kept him in division, and they called him PIO, or Public Information Officer. He did writing for the division. Well, he came down when they had this one entertainment group come over, and uh, Tom, they had a seat in the very front for about four or five of the PIOs. <laughs> he brought me a PIO cap. And I wouldn't be out, so I could go up and sit in the front seat. So I'm here, I'm up there sitting in the front seat. And one of the wheels and regiment come by and saw me, Thomas, Thomas, what are you doing here? <laughs> here, I got crawled under. Uh, well, I was wondering, you, I think you said you flew to Hawaii that was the first time you, you flew. So, yeah. Did you fly into Korea or did you go by ship? Uh, no, I flew over. 
uh, officers, you had your choice of flying or, uh, or service transportation. Do you remember your, your first day of landing in Korea? What was your oh, first day? Yeah, I remember pretty much because we were put in a, in a, I think it was a bus, and taken to the, yeah, because we were put in from the airport. We were put in a bus, and I remember the gate, going out, checking at the gate. And this Korean's out there wanting to sell dirty pictures. He had pictures of nude women. <laughs> he wanted to sell pictures. We got to the train station, and half the building had been blown away. And that's where we got on the train. And it was like cars that come out of the 100-year-old cars with, two, with just a single set of wheels in the back and the front. And then the hot boxes, the boxes where they put grease rays on the axles. And uh, uh, we got in those to go north. And uh, the train parallel this valley pretty far north. And up close to DMZ where we got off. And, uh, but that's when I told you they had uh, the the Korean soldiers flying us to keep people still in the grease right out of the hot box. I'll tell you it's another flight. What do they want the grease rags for? What's that? What do the, the Korean people want the grease rags for? For fuel. They were short on fuel. Oh, okay. They were very short on fuel. In fact, you could tell in those mountains in the springtime uh, when the snow got off, or, you know, they would take the vegetation and um, you could see how high the mountains it was. On, on an island, how, how they were trimmed. And one of those mountains where it looked like a teepee, it was round like a teepee, and I'll never forget it. They had dug defensive positions in them and zigzagged them so that, you know, a line of fire could knock out a whole bunch. And I remember the snow falling in it, and it looked like an Indian teepee with the design on it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, of all the training I had, and I had some great training, you know, you still have stuff that you never encountered. You just got to use logic for. Uh, what was your experience about, with the weather over there? We got pretty extreme both uh, seasons, right? Well, the monsoons, you were always warm. And the only time you were dry, if you took off all your clothes and was lying on your bed, you know, your tent, your body heat would dry out. But the minute you went out that door, you were wet. And they had those wet suits, rubber wet suits. But if you put one of those on, you'd suffocate. So you just went out and got wet. And uh, at mine zones, it, it would go like from early part of July into about the middle of August. Now, it's caused by the Gobi Desert. They had these big updrafts, and they suck the water in over Japan and you know, out of the ocean. When the temperature changes and they quit having an updraft, it's just like they stop. It's just like somebody turned off a shower head. It quit raining, it was pretty, and you had a rather, you know, regular weather up until about October. And then the Gobi Desert had changed. It would get real cold. And then the cold air would be dense, it would push out. And that's what causes those extreme temperatures, you know, in Korea. But again, that cold air was so dry with no moisture in it that it didn't take the heat away from your body like it does, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. around here. But I could tell when it started getting below zero, your nose would burn inside. And I found out later on that those little blood vessels were freezing what caused that burning sensation. <laughs> How do you keep warm? If you were outside. Uh, we had good clothes. We had the Arctic down. Um, we had they call Mickey Mouse boots, big overstuffed boots. Oh, they were terrible to walk with, but they kept your feet warm. And uh, we had uh, clothing issued to us, uh, cold weather clothing, and we had parkas. And they come down. We had to tie them so that if you left them untied, they'd flip and fan you out. But time. And uh, another thing too, if you touch anything metal, your finger would stick to it. 
Uh, even a trigger finger, we had a glove with like a nylon finger mm -hmm. to touch the trigger. And the tankers were the one I felt so far. Could he touched any place on that tank. You know, once they started up, got hot, but uh, I didn't want to be a tanker in Korea. Yeah, one guy that we interviewed not too long ago, he, he talked about orphans. Did you have much of like his orphans? Did you was it? Did you see much of that where your part of Korea? No, most of those they had taken them south. They were down below Seoul, and uh, I did. I uh, have one thing on Pim Chong, our houseboy. I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but Seoul had changed hands so many times on a MSR 3 that uh, the communists came down and the civilians just shot a bunch of them and just pushed them over and rice bag them out of the way. And the U.S. engineers come along and covered them up with dirt. Well, the monsoons come along and washed all these bones out, and on Pim Chong is out there with me one day and we're looking at the bones and he says, one of those belonged to a cousin of mine was 13 and she was shot and pushed over in there. And you know, you have the sad things that happened then. Yeah. I guess there was still a lot of damage you mentioned before already. But oh, was, oh, everything yeah. was tore up. Everything was tore up. The buildings were tore up and, and soul was in pathetic shape. That's why I, I have a lot of respect for the Korean people because I saw what it was then and what they've done now is just miraculous. Have you ever gone back at all? No, I'll tell you what, when I left there, the day I left, I said, I'll never come back to this place again. I'm ready to go back for a visit though. I, I watch NHK news, Japanese news, and they have a lot of uh, news program out of South Korea. Well, obviously Korea has been in the news a lot lately. Have you been following yeah. that? Any thoughts on the uh, latest developments? Yeah, if you see on that spot where Kim Jong Un on stuff from North Korea to South Korea, when I was there, I was there at that location too. They had sandbags and he had periscopes because if you raised up, they'd take a pot shot at you. Now the sandbags are gone. <laughs> you can use field glasses if you want to look at a distance. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Pan Moon John was uh, right over from me. You could see it, but. It was on the north side. Uh, I have just a couple of questions about your post, uh, you know, your civilian life you know, later on. I, I was just kind of curious if, uh, you know, you said you were an accountant and decided to change and start your own business. And I was wondering how you went about doing that and, and why did you go with import cars? Why did you go with foreign cars as opposed to a different kind of, like, domestic cars. Is there a reason for that? A lot like what now? I never understood your question. Uh, when you started to start your own business, you went into like import car business, like foreign cars. Yeah. Uh, was there a reason why you wanted, you chose those kind of cars to do business? This is back in like seven. Yeah. Uh, I always, well, I always like the looks of MGs. And uh, uh, see, in World War II, the GIs who were in England uh, fell in love with MGs and Triumphs. And then after the war, the Brits were you know, bankrupt. And they built MG TDs the same as they did in the 30s, had wood in them and everything, and they sent them over here and they sold them for about $1,200 a piece. But uh, the ex-GIs had buy them. And they were a lot of, uh, the, they weren't that great of a car. You know, they were geared lower for American mm -hmm. highways and everything, but they were fun to run around in, canvas tops and all that. And, but uh, you had a lot of people uh, were attracted. You know, they made better cars and the MG TDs and TAs and uh, the MGBs. And, uh, my generation of people fell in love with them. And there was a big business for it. I had, you know, big business for parts on them. And right. my friend Ralph Crawford, you know, that's all what he sold. He still sticks to foreign cars. And Riley Ralph. Yeah. So when, what did you start out with uh, uh, when you started the business? What was, did you, did you expand into other different kind of cars or, or did you 
you know, well, what happened? I did some accounting work for Walter Auto Parts, and uh, I did. Uh, I always liked cars. I was a amateur mechanic. When when I grew up on a farm, we had a neighbor who worked on tractors, and everybody. Well, if I didn't, if I had some time, I'd go up and work with him. He didn't pay me anything, but. I ground valves and on old tractors, and I learned a lot about putting on brakes. So I always had an interest on cars, and I still work on my own cars to an extent now, like brakes and things like that. Uh, but cars, you know, always fascinate me. And then the British sport car always fascinate me. And uh, uh, I then worked uh, for Walton Auto Parts. In fact, they helped me get started because they didn't want anything to do with foreign cars. And I started selling, uh, handling foreign cars out there, and then I moved to Ellesmere and, you know, started Alpine Imports. But I'd already had, you know, the momentum going by the time I started them up in Ellesmere. I think you also mentioned, did you eventually get into Volkswagens and things like that? Uh, well, where I did, where I really got heavy in Volkswagen, there were so many Beatles. They were like a half a million Beatles sold here a year. Well, uh, there were some Brazilian companies that started stamping out parts for them. Fenders and doors mm -hmm. and running boards. And uh, there were a lot of companies, they had a little air-cooled four-cylinder engine and they had some, some cylinders. Well, I was buying from an import out of New York, I bought a lot of sheet metal and I would sell fenders and it was as good as the Germans. Uh, you know, the, the quality was very good. So that's why I, there were so many Beatles out there that I sold a ton. I'd buy every wreck Beetle I could find. And I even had engine stands where I could take the little engine out and put it on a stand and run it. People here running, you know, on a stand. Uh, I, had a, I had a good business going. And then, you know, eventually uh, everybody started handling, getting handled in a few foreign cars. But yeah, a lot of them say, I won't handle those foreign cars. And, and uh, I go to the salvage pool and, you know, that I never handled an American car while I was in business. But I had recommendations, you know, from other dealers. So I think you said you got out about 87. Was there a reason why you decided to get out of the car business? Or? Yeah, I was just tired. I was putting so much time in on it. And, uh, I started dabbling a little bit in real estate. And, getting a rental property and working on it. I helped a few friends of mine at an antique auto shop. I helped them do some work. And uh, not full time, just part time. Uh, just uh, one or a few more questions. Uh, so did, did you uh, ever keep in touch with anybody you served with uh, when you were in the military? Anybody, did you keep in touch with anybody? Did I ever do what now? Uh, keep in touch with anybody. While well, I was in the military? Oh yeah, I had my girlfriend Lexi and I was right twice, three times a week and I got that many letters from her and, and my family. Uh, uh, my mother and I had a sister who was in Indianapolis. She was a school teacher. And uh, uh, my brother, uh, he was, uh, my brother had gone to the Air Force right when he got out of school. And then um, he got married and he went, he went to UK. He started down there after I did. I was a year ahead of him. Uh, but he also majored in accounting and he had a career with Internal Revenue Service. He started and helped when Newport was being cleaned up. He worked with IRS when they were cleaning up Newport. And he was later on a manager of the Dayton office, Dayton, Ohio office. Mm -hmm. But I used to correspond with him and his wife a lot. And, and I, I'll tell you another little story too. I had an aunt who had a son in World War II and lived in Florence. And she loved to bake. And she would make these big cakes and mail to her son, ship them. Well, he was with uh, the Air Force and uh, I think he was with the 8th Air Force. And I don't know, I don't know what he did. I don't know if he was on flight or not, but they were there in England. Well, when I was in Korea, she kind of adopted me. 
she would make big cakes and send over to me. And our mail clerk would tell every fellow in the unit that I got a cake and all would come up with one slice. <laughs> so I wrote back and I told my Aunt Elizabeth, I said, you just made 200 men happy with your cake. <laughs> I won't say it was 200. I, I maybe mean, got a big piece, but it got spread around. Have you ever been part of any kind of reunions or anything? Uh, in the military, I used to keep up with a few of them, and I uh, talked to uh, a couple of the lieutenants, one of them uh, who lives at uh, Buffalo, New York. I keep in touch with him. But I lost contact with uh, uh, several of them. The uh, warrant officer, he passed away about six or seven years ago. He lived in Louisiana. He was retired. And he was a fantastically interested person. He went into North Africa uh, when they first went to North Africa, the first armored division. In the Battle of Kasserine Pass, his tank unit lasted 28 minutes or I'm gonna knock the heck out of them. And they captured them. And they took him to the toe of Italy, and that's when Italy and Mussolini was in power. And he mm -hmm. said the Italians would throw rocks at him. They were in freight cars. But it, when he got to Germany, he was a prisoner for three years. And he said the, the Germans treated him very well. And they would get these rest cross packages, and the Germans would always want to trade them out of their cigarettes. I think the Germans stole about half of them and gave about half of them to right. the prisoners. But he talked about having a border operation and he took him into a sidecar from Stalag where he was to a hospital in Berlin. They operated on him and he said while they were there, Berlin was being bombed. They put him in a sidecar and took him back. He got good medical treatment. So for the German people, he had, was very complimentary. And when he left Korea, he went back over to an assignment in Germany and looked up a lot of these people that he had known during the war. But he uh, later on retired. He was uh, thought maybe they may nail him to go to Vietnam and he was tired of, he had been to Korea and he was tired and he had over about 23 or 24 years in and he retired. And then he went to work army down at uh, Fort uh, Polk, Louisiana. Uh, supervising tank uh, repairs. But he passed away, but he was very interesting. Uh, one of the other old stories, An Pyeong Chong, the Korean, he used to make up our beds or clean our tent out once a week. We had a pillow that had feathers and it was leaking some feathers on the bread. So I come in and An Pyeong Chong says, Mr. Thomas, or Lieutenant Thomas, you have chicken hair on your bed, and <laughs> they call feathers chicken hair. <laughs> and I can see logically it was, sure. but I always thought that was one of the cute stories. Thank you. Well, I think we've, uh, we've reached the, about the end of our um, interview, and I want to thank you and tell you how much we appreciate it. Well, I enjoy talking about rehab, and like I said, uh, I had some wonderful experiences. I really did. Well, I want to thank you for the interview, and I also want to thank you for being a patriot and for serving our country. Well, thank you. Thank you, Don.